Hello and welcome. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. Thank you for joining us for our online program, Between Worlds from Page to Stage, with poet Irina Klepish, here from New York, playwright and actor Naomi Newman, and co-artistic director of Yiddish theater ensemble, Bruce Bierman, who is the director of Between Worlds. Today, I play a dual role, one as moderator, and also as co-artistic director of Yiddish theater ensemble and producer of Between Worlds. The play we're discussing today, Between Worlds, is produced, as I mentioned, by Yiddish theater ensemble and conceived and written by acclaimed actress, Naomi Newman. It's inspired by Arena's recently published book, Her Birth and Later Years, New and Collected Poems, 1971 to 2021, which is published by Wesleyan University Press. The play Between Worlds is described as a new play about the transformative power of poetry and a writer's journey facing the traumas of war, displacement, and identity. Performances run August 16th through 20th at the Live Oak Theater in Berkeley as part of YTE's New Works Lab production. Information about the show is on the YTE website in the chat. Now, if you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we were one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs, and Friday night, our Cinema Lit Film series. Please visit us at milibrary.org. Also, if you are in San Francisco, please join us for a free weekly tour, Wednesdays at noon. After our conversation today, we will have a Q&A with you, our audience, and we ask that you put your questions in the chat. If you would like to purchase a copy of Arena's new book, Her Birth and Later Years, please go to Afi Komen Books online or in person, and that information will also be in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce our guest today. Arena Klepfish taught Jewish women's studies at Barnard College for 22 years. She is the author of five books of poetry, including Her Birth in Later Years, which, is the, which was the winner of the 2023 Audre Lorde Award for Lesbian Poetry and a finalist for the 2023 National Jewish Book Award. Also, Periods of Stress, Keeper of Accounts, Different Enclosures, and A Few Words in the Mother Tongue, and a collection of essays, Dreams of an Insomniac. She is one of the foremost advocates of the Yiddish language and its renaissance in the United States, and her work has appeared in Tablet Magazine, the Manhattan Review, the Georgia Review, in the... De, 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 Geveb, <laughs> Sinister Wisdom, The Current, and Languages of Modern Jewish Cultures, and we're just thrilled to have her here. Bruce Bierman is co-artistic director of Yiddish Theater Ensemble, and he's directed and choreographed YTE's acclaimed production of The De Megillah of Itzik Monger and the award-winning filmed version of Sholem Ash's God of Vengeance. He also served as Yiddish dance consultant for several productions of Paula Vogel's Indecent at the Arena Stage and also the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and most recently served as dramaturg for the award-winning co-production with a San Francisco Playhouse of Indecent. His versatile theater work as an actor, director, playwright, and choreographer have been seen throughout LA and the Bay Area. He is also a passionate teacher uh, for creative aging and brings dance and theater programs to elders and memory care patients of all abilities throughout the Bay Area. And Naomi Newman. Before co-founding a traveling Jewish theater, Naomi was a concert singer, television actor, actor, improvisational theater director, and psychotherapist. For over three decades with TJT, 
She changed hats between director, playwright, performer, winning awards in all fields. She directed her colleague, Corey Fisher, in, in his seminal show, Lightning in the Brain. And then Mr. Fisher directed her in uh, World on Fire, a poetry music piece about climate, climate disruption conceived of and performed by Ms. Newman and Barbara Borden, percussionist, and Suzanne DiVincenzo on bass and cello were also in our production. For this particular piece, World on Fire, she won the Social Change Through Music Award at the National Women's Music Festival in 2021. And Naomi has also appeared in other our other YTE productions that we mentioned. So please welcome our esteemed guests. We're so glad to have you here before we open the show. So I'd like to start with Arena. It, it, it all starts with you. So um, please tell us about how birth, her birth and later years came about. Um, it's a sort of in almost something I really didn't plan and came, it came about very, very quickly. I hadn't published for a number of years. I'd been active in the 90s and the aughts on, on various Yiddish issues and done various kind of writing, but I hadn't published any poetry. And um, a, a Few Words in the Mother Tongue was out of print. And sometime around, I don't know, 2016 or so, I decided to look through my journals and collected what I considered to be a new collection of poems, which I called Her Birth and Later Years. And I was talking to my friend, Julie Enser, who's the editor of Sinister Wisdom. And I sent it to her and she really liked it. And she she either sent it or told me to send it to Wesleyan. And Wesleyan really liked it, but felt it was too small a book. At which point, um, Julie said, well, why don't you do a collected work since the other work was out of print, since a few words in the mother tongue was out of print. So we just joined it, and um, I was very happy to have the other work back in print and very happy to have the new work out there. And so it was quite easy, I mean, in some ways, and was not anything I had really planned on um, doing sort of the whole spectrum of my publishing life. So that's how it came about. It was one of the easiest and least painless publication stories I think you'll ever encounter. Uh, it was it, positive all the way. Yeah, it's great to have this whole the panorama of of all your work together in one place. Um, one thing I also want to ask is about you know the content of your work and your writing. It's it's so much tied to your personal history. Um, and can you tell that tell about how your life story informs your writing and also your writing style? Um. Well, you know, first of all, um, I turned to poetry because I was very frustrated with English. English was sort of my fourth language. I mean, I was, as you know, I was born during the war, so I spoke Polish. That was my first, that was my mother tongue. And after the war, I heard for the first time Yiddish, and I understood it. I mean, I don't know whether I understood it instinctively, but I never spoke it. But people around me spoke to me in Yiddish. I heard them speaking to each other. And then I spent three years in Sweden with other survivors and my mother, and they all was the same thing. They spoke Polish and Yiddish. I spoke po only Polish to my mother, but I understood everything around me. So it was sort of, I understood Yiddish, but didn't speak it. At the same time, I went to a Swedish school and I learned Swedish and I learned to write. Um, I learned, I spoke fluently, read and wrote till the second grade. Their, their, their second grade is about our fourth grade. So I was very fluent in it. And then I came to the States and I was deeply unhappy. I loved my life in Sweden. I did not like my life in the United States, in the Bronx, though it was a very wonderful area in many, many ways. And I struggled with the language. Um, it was my worst subject in high school. They kicked me out of honors, honors English. I mean, it was very painful. And I turned to poetry because I really felt nobody could, I thought in poetry, you can do whatever you want. There are no mistakes in poetry and nobody could tell me I did anything wrong. So I started writing rather some, some rather bad poetry. <laughs> and 
And um, interestingly enough, and I think uh, Naomi will, will like to hear this, or maybe she even knows it. When I was about 17, I was a pianist in a Yiddish camp called Boibrick. And one of the people teach uh, was the counselor of the oldest group was a young woman, Flora Fairstein, who eventually evolved into Hannah Block. And so we were in camp together, the poet, and we confessed to each other that we both wanted, she was a year older than me. And I was very impressed with her because she was already going into college and I was going into my senior year of high school. But we confessed to each other that we were very interested in poetry and being poets. And that was very, and we we totally lost touch for about 25 years <laughs> or 30 years. And um, and I turned to poetry to, um, to just be able to express myself because English just was so difficult for me. And initially, um, and I think you can see this through the book, I was very focused on the Holocaust and I was, I have to say in some despair that I thought I would never get off of the topic that I thought the only thing I could ever write about was the Holocaust. But when I came out, I found out I had a very, I had a much more complicated life than that. And, um, and I think poetry, I think most of us who write um, reflect where we are at whatever point in our lives. So obviously the topics changed, though some remained because history like that, you just don't put aside. Um, you don't just leave it behind, it kind of reoccurs. And um, and it took me a while to develop a kind of voice, I think, that I felt comfortable with. Um, as you, some of you probably know, I mean, I like to lay out my poems on the page a lot. Um, I want to know how the poem looks, but I also want, I, I recite everything out loud when I'm writing. I'm very oral, and uh, even when it's a poem that I wouldn't read out loud necessarily. So that's, so I listen to it, you know, um, and I think it just, I have a friend, Susan Sherman, some people may know her work. She, Susan always said, if you want to change your poetry, you have to change your life because your life and your poetry are linked, always linked. <laughs> so I think that that's something that's that like I accept very well. Well, it's amazing that the po poetry gave you this incredible voice, Arena, and also a voice on the page and also vocally, verbally. Um, and so we're we're so grateful for that. Um, I'd like to invite you to read a few of your poems. We'd, we'd love to hear. Okay, I'm going to read two rather short poems and then a slightly longer one. Um, this one's called A Poem for Judy. As some of you can see, there's a painting behind me. My late partner, Judith Waterman, was a wonderful, wonderful painter. Um, I'm in the process right now of trying to catalog with a friend of mine, Gabby Van Seltman, to, to catalog her work. So I thought it'd be nice to read a poem. Judy was very dedicated to her work, to her painting, and always sought um, to find nighttime jobs so she could use the daylight to paint but sometimes that didn't work out. And this is a poem when it didn't work out and she had to take a daytime job. So this is, a, this is called A Poem for Judy, Beginning a New Job. I will keep this simple, not give it a universal significance nor transform it into art. You say, I will not do this forever. I will paint. I've learned now that it's no solace to point out the others, so many others, straining, wasting, unable to do what they know they must do. For such loss is always solitary and unshared, outside the scope of bloodless theory. You do not paint and what must happen does not happen. The transformation on the empty canvas of the elusive marble into the shadowy water or the simple water into impenetrable rock. And nothing, nothing, not even a loving embrace nor special intimate midnight talk will ever make up or diminish that loss for you or for her or her or her. 
This next poem is totally on a different part of my other kind of life. This was uh, based on a trip I took with my mother in 1983 back to Poland for the first time. And um, we, at the time, we went to a small, small memorial for the Umschlagplatz in Warsaw for the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, it was a time of, you know, when Solidarność was illegal. The Pope had just visited Warsaw. So it was a very tumultuous time. It was also the 40th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising when my father died as well. So this is called Warsaw 1983, Umschlagplatz. Ich bin nicht gewen in Treblinka. I was never in Treblinka, a quote from Hey Levick. No horrors this time. It's 1983, June, summer. Warsaw is tense, but over Solidarność, over amnesty. A small white brick wall, two plaques in Polish and Yiddish, to the effect that from here, seinen sie geforen, kein Treblinka. Two stubby candles on either side, neither burning. The guide lights one with a lighter. The wind blows it out. A gas station pumping gas right behind. A building on one side, perhaps from that time, Efshar and Edus, maybe it saw. And there are tracks, I think. I do not cry. What's to cry about? An ordinary street, people going about their business 40 years later, tense about amnesty. The street, this street might have been my home. This street might have been the beginning of my journey to death. I must remember it was neither. I live on another continent. It's 1983. I am now a visitor. History stops for no one. And then this other poem, the final poem I want to read today is, um, if I can find it, is, um, was inspired by Chaim Grades, the Yiddish poet's um, memoir about his, partly about his mother, not entirely, called Amama Shabbosim, My Mother's Sabbath Days. And um, I was very taken with the book, and I wanted to write about my mother's Sabbath days, except we weren't observant, so we didn't have Sabbath <laughs> days, basically. But I still wanted to write it, and I I refer here to my mother was a seamstress, and she worked for a really glamorous fashion designer, and they made all different kinds of, you know, um, she had different shows, four shows a year, and it, so I make some reference to that. I think that's about all I need to explain. Dalmama Shabbosim, my mother's Sabbath days, inspired by Vela Grada and Chaim Grada's memoir. By uns is es given anders. I knew nothing of the 613 mitzvahs which did not bind me, nor of the three which did, though I am sure my grandmother Rikla Perchikov knew them all. And I have a vague image of her covering her eyes and swaying. Shoshana, Rushka, Loja, Mama Lo, and more recently Rose, in short, my mother in all her reincarnations, she did not pass on such things. She'd given them up even before she'd ever claimed them. She was more modern, and besides, there were other matters to teach. So by age 11, I was a passionate socialist, impatient, so impatient to grow into my knowledge, never guessing there was no choice for work and rest, wrestled in every human life with work, inevitably the unbeatable winner. So for us, it was different. Erev Shabbos was plain Freitag, or more precisely, Piontek. I remember summer evenings, I wait for her at the Mashalu stop of the Lexington line, bright heat and light at six o'clock. She was full of tales of Miss Kant, the designer, a career woman longing for home and family, in love with a handsome pilot, of Scotty, the model who married smart, a wealthy buyer, and now sat brazenly chic in a reform synagogue. I listened eager to understand these widow tales of romance amid the rush of each season's showing, and once even saw on a page of the Times 
a mannequin dressed in the very gown Mama Lo had made. All the way up to Rome Avenue, we'd walk past the Jewish deli where we never ate. What was the point if you could make it at home? Past the pizza place where occasionally while shopping, she'd buy me a slice. Past the outdoor groceries, fruit stands, fabric, shoes, lingerie, and stationery stores till Gun Hill Road and Jay Gardens. Perhaps I knew it was Trafe. She certainly did but was not concerned. We'd order the salty wonton soup, chow mein or pepper steak. And though she mocked the food, she never resisted. It was Friday, the shop was closed. We'd eat dinner and like the rich, lean leisurely back in our booth. I didn't know it was Erev Shabbos, still she rested. Laura, you're you're muted. <laughs> ah, here we go. Um, Marina, thank you for that beautiful reading. I love how you paint these pictures of the past. You're just zooming into this whole panorama, and also bringing us right into the present of the whole. I can I can just smell the Bronx right there. Um, but I want to also mention that, of course, this year was the 80th uh, anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, and just for you to. Tell us more about how that's such a, how it's so significant for you before we move on to Naomi. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of, I mean, when I think about the 40th and then the 80th, it's, um, well, you know, it has, it's, um, it's a marker. I mean, it's a, a very incredible marker in which I think I work with a group or I have, I actually stepped off of this because I, I thought it was time of a group that commemorates the uprising every year. It's mainly children of Bundist, Jewish labor Bundist um, children. Um, we're all in our 60s at the youngest probably, maybe. And um, so I've been very involved in that. And I think we've we've come to understand that we have to switch in some way or that there's these subtle changes in how we memorialize that there's a younger generation. These commemorations that I've been going to for years were originally all in Yiddish. They're now mostly in English, though we maintain some Yiddish in them. So it's a different, you know, it's different in that these, these were filled with survivors when we had these commemorations. The survivors are not there anymore. I mean, they are now the children of survivors. And now it's even the grandchildren of survivors. So it's it's a very totally different approach. And one of the things we've struggled with was what to what to convey to a younger generation, what to try to teach them. So I think it's um it's changed. I mean, in some ways, it's become a more distant history. And that we and it's not as emotional. I mean, we don't have survivors standing there who survived either ghettos or camps or in hiding or in Russia or whatever. We used to have that. We had those witnesses and we don't have that anymore. Um, so I think it's, it's, we have to be, I think, careful. I'm always very leery of commercialization. I'm leery of political uses of the Holocaust, which I have for years just sort of cringed about it. And we have to be careful how we memorialize also and that heroism isn't everything. I mean, I know in my own case, I always felt my father, of course, got a lot of credit and has always been acknowledged for his participation and his contribution. But my mother never got the credit because he died a year and a half before the war was over. I mean, I was saved by my mother, but she never got recognition for this in any way. And I think the feminist movement I mean, I'm sure Naomi knows this as well. I mean, the feminist movement made me even look at the past in a different kind of way where I thought I thought very differently about it. Didn't diminish anything my father did, but I also realized that there was credit other places or there was recognition of ordinary women who did very ordinary things that had extraordinary consequences. Let me put it that way. And I, I think of my mother in that way. Yeah. And also, you know, in in our production of Between Worlds, we're also portraying both the valor and the bravery of both your father, who died as a, a as a partisan and a martyr, killed. You know, he 
sacrificed himself in the in the uprising, and also the strength of the mother. So I think those those are important important things to to acknowledge as well the the women's roles and and your mother's role. Um, but I want to move on to Naomi Newman and Naomi. I just want to find out about you know you've had a long relationship with with Irina. Uh, tell us about your connection and past, and also what motivated you to create a theater piece from these incredible poems. Unmute yourself. Oh, you have to unmute. Uh, our long connection has mostly been um, letters, emails, and Zooms. We have met a few times. Um, it was when a traveling Jewish theater uh, did a, a piece called Diamonds in the Dark, a bilingual poetry piece. And I performed two of Irina's poems, Fredo Stuck and Ethel Heverta, of Mama Lush, a few words in the mother tongue. And I loved doing those poems. And people loved hearing me do them. And in fact, they became really the most impactful pieces in Diamonds in the Dark. And at that time, so from that time, I was just a major fan and uh, read everything in the book which was in print at that time. Um, but when I did that play, uh, Diamonds in the Dark, I, um, I just had like a urge, dream, fantasy, I don't know, as stuck in my psyche about more doing a lot of Irina's poetry. So when uh, Irish Theater Ensemble asked me to do another project and suggested another uh, ancient uh, Yiddish play, I said, that has nothing to do with today anymore. But Irina's poetry does. Let's do a play based on her poetry. So that's, that's how it all happened. Can't hear you. I, um, Naomi, would you like to share a few of your favorite poems? Um, these are some of the one, poems that will be in the show. Yes. And, and by the way, I just want to say something to Irina. When you read your poems now, they have become part of my skin. <laughs> they are in the play. And Bruce's. I was watching Bruce's face, and it was so full of, yeah, I know that stuff. <laughs> you know, intimacy. It's an amazing intimacy. Um, I'll start with a beautiful love poem. I, I, I said it at my beloved Barbara Bor uh, Borton's birthday. I said it to her because I think it is so touching and deep. And um, I don't even, we call it the tree dream. Last night, I dreamt I was a gaunt and 
lifeless tree. Then you climbed into me to nest. You were calm, so serious, as you wrapped your legs around my trunk and pressed your body to me. Oh my goodness, I've been sick. It will come back and press your body. And wherever your human skin touched my rough bark, I sprouted branches, then lush with leaves. I became all green and silver, frail-like tinsel. It's so strange when you know uh, I've been performing that poem in rehearsal, but now that Irina was listening to it, I got nervous. Okay. Et lechaverte oif mamlosh. A few words in the mother tongue. Lemosh, for example. Di the the whore. A woman who acknowledges her passion. The Jewish, the Jewish woman, ignorant, overbearing. Let's face it, every woman is one. The yente, the gossip, the busybody who knows what's what and is never caught off guard. The lesbian. The one with the roommate, though we never use the word. Thus, Bible, the wife, or the little woman, in their thing, at home, where she does everything to keep Yiddishkeit alive. Yiddishkeit, a way of being Jewish, always arguable. In Mark, where she buys the kartoffel und hal, yes, potatoes and hal, the kartoffel, the material counterpart of Yiddishkeit. Mitzibbles with onions that bring tears to her eyes when she sees how little it all is. Venike und venike, less and less. Die Hall. Braided the your father Hassan, like her hair. When she was a shame made, long schwarz hair, the long schwarz hair. A Frey Holland, ihr Ort, euch der Welt, her place in the world, und sie hat Neue, and she is afraid, so afraid of the words Kurve, Jene, Jente, Lesbianke, Weibel. 
sie holt ihr Ort die Welt der Rhein, die Hähn, der Mark am Mädelholm a Kurve holm a jene holm a jene holm a das Bianke holm a Weib holm die holm die lange schwarze Hoch. Sie rollen, sie rollen, sie rollen. Thank you, Naomi. That was a surprise. I was waiting for it between worlds, but also this is also one of the most uh, powerful poems uh, in in this collection and also in in this theater piece um identity and assignment and so so gorgeous in both the English and the Yiddish parallel. So I want to turn to Bruce to um, talk to you about you know what inspired you to um, bring this work to the stage, the themes that most uh, you know, spoke to you about uh, in translating from poetry to to theater form, and what what influenced you in 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 this work, and also in in the theater genre, other plays or other styles that you're bringing in to make the poetry come alive. Yeah, well, when Naomi and I initially discussed, and Naomi proposed uh, doing a collection of Irena Klepfish's work, um, I would do anything, really, Naomi asked. I, I have been following Naomi and a traveling Jewish theater since my college days in Santa Cruz and taking trips up to see a traveling Jewish theater and specifically their work and how they dealt with the beautiful Yiddish language and poetry and the simplicity and imagination and I wanted to learn these things. Actually, I really wanted to study with Naomi theater in some way and no better way to study than to do a play because you're gonna go through hell and you're gonna go through blood and a lot of sweat. And if you come out to the other side, wow. And I really feel we've come out into this beautiful creation. Um, uh, like Naomi said, I was smiling so much when Irena was reading her poem because we were just working on that poem last night. And it's so fresh, every word, every image in my head. This is why I come to theater is it's my university. This is I learn about poets. I learn, you know, I, I learned about things about the Warsaw Ghetto. I had no idea. And about the Bund and uh, um. And this is why I come to theater. And, and early on, I was asking, well, what form would best hold this play? Would it be? And, and as a theater director, I love different forms. I love Stanislavski method, Meyerhold. And uh, of course, as a director, I hold a special feelings for Bertolt Brecht. Um, and I, I, I kind of imagine, I wonder how Irena feels about Brecht and uh, this style of storytelling that is meant to jostle an audience and to wake them up and to show at every moment of the character, this is Breck's theory of their important decisions in life. What important decisions uh, the father made, that Rose made, that Judith made, and to really highlight those. Um, as a director, sometimes, you have the habit of you you can hide and let all the actors be vulnerable and let all the actors do the the plumbing and inside work 
Well, Naomi caught me early because I was asking, well, what does this piece mean to you? And what does this mean to you? And Naomi turned it on me and she said, what does this piece mean to you? And I really had to think about that. And to me, I really related to Irena's writings on many levels, uh, but especially about feeling as a queer person, being an outsider or feeling like an outsider my whole life. And I almost feel like I found a friend in Irena who understood that feeling of being an outsider, the pain of being an outsider, but also the special position an outsider has to observe. And um, that that has given me a lot of gifts in my life. And that people on the fringe, be they Jewish or queer, often have that position of walking in between worlds and giving a very special perspective and I think wisdom into the world. Anyway, I hope that answered your question. Right. Yeah, there's there's so many potent themes that are in your work arena and that we've brought into the play. Um, when we're talking about the Holocaust, even in the in the poem Bashert, where we're exploring you're exploring a dedication to those who have died and then also to those who have survived and bridging these two worlds together in one poem. So, so rich, so deep and so gorgeous. And I just wanted to talk about some of the other themes, the immigrant, the immigrant experience, which is so potent today and also identity. So I just want to open up the conversation about these themes um, as we've been we've been talking about them and hearing them and in, in the poems, um, Naomi, Bruce, Irina. Well, um, one of the things I, I dedicate my work to is my parents, who uh, my father from Poland my mother from Lithuania. Um, they were Buddhists and Yiddishists. And unlike a lot of immigrants, uh, they were not entranced with melting into the American melting pot. They were very they loved the Yiddish language. They did not speak it, so we would not understand what was they were saying. They spoke it, so we would understand. And we went to Yiddish school. And it really tuned my brain into a receptivity for foreign languages and for, as Bruce talked about, uh, immigrants living on the outside because my parents always live actually between two or three worlds. My father started Yiddish culture cent uh, centers and my mother loved the poetry and the songs. And Irina, she loved the poem. Uh, my mom is she blossom. She always quoted it to me. And um, so it gave me an openness to Yiddish, but also to other languages. I learned other languages quite not beautifully, but I spoke Italian, I learned Italian and French and some German when I was singing. 
And when I traveled, so uh, Yiddish just went into my psyche in a very deep place. I think I went off the question, but yeah. Um, a a another theme that strikes deep and I think it strikes deeper. Everyone in the cast and and most artists is this struggle between having to work and doing their art, which is so so honestly articulated in Irena's poems, and everybody feels it. Um, that schizophrenia that sometimes artists have to split themselves to to survive, to pay the rent, and to do their art, and that's a theme, a, a portion that Naomi brought into the play. And in fact, I have a question while I have Irena here that um, there's this moment that we take in the play of young Irena deciding, making a choice to call in sick and stay home <laughs> and, and, and read. Uh, the book that she's reading is The Man and the Whale. I'm assuming that's uh, Moby Dick. Yes. And uh, there is an outburst from the mother, Rose, that's very startling and very curious. It, it just feels like there's so much trauma in it. And in the poem, Irena describes Rose, the mother, uh, pacing the apartment like, a, 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 I think, wild savage. And, and then bursting into the room to young Irena, who's reading, who called in sick, saying, get up, get up now. And I'm just so curious. I would love to ask Irena what was under that. Was it that she was afraid of you losing the money, of losing the job, of, of lying to the boss? I, I wonder what was under that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, that's actually, that's from the poem Context. It's one of the sections of the work of the poem Context. And it's about partly that begins with my much older self doing a job that I really don't want to be doing. Um, and that, I mean, it was funny because I was just talking to my friend Gabby about this particular episode um, that's that you're talking about. I think... I wrote that from a much more adult point of view in that I'm totally sympathetic with my younger self, but I having also experienced, I mean, when we first came to the United States, we were really poor. I mean, we were sharing an apartment, a one bedroom apartment that cost $41 a month that my mother couldn't afford. So we were living in the living room and somebody else was living in the bedroom. And still, you know, I know other people have it even worse. And we were, but we did that for about four years. And she was trying to live on sewing alterations, you know, raising and lowering hems or tightening and loosening waistlines. You know, this was in those days. This is 49, 50, 51, 52. This is like 25 cents, you know, to do the hem. Or it was really, it was really tough for her. What did I know? I mean, I was just a kid. I was eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, and I think my mother was always very um, conscious that you can't just be glib about economics. You can't be this frivolous. You cannot, you know, that life is tough and you've got to be tough. Now, she, I think in many ways, I mean, as I grew up, I think, you know, the thing that I think we all experience this. There are certain defenses that really work at certain times, but they don't really work at later times or at different times. And I think there was that, that she didn't really totally see a changing circumstance that maybe it wouldn't have been that intense. But I think she thought that I couldn't afford to be this way, that she was really, I mean, that she was she was angry because, and, and the way the scene ends is that I hear her working in the kitchen cutting the material for the next client, you know, that you work, you don't pick when you decide to want to work. You don't pick that, you know, you have to, you have to learn that. Um, 
And that's, you know, whether she taught it to me the right way or the wrong way is another question. But I think that's what was underneath that, that I certainly didn't understand at the time that it happened. But in the context of that whole long poem, looking back and looking at the various kind of pushes, that economic pushes. I mean, there were times when I was, when I wrote, the, I wrote that poem context at a time when I had lost my only full-time teaching job. I had one full-time teaching job after, grad, after graduate school for four years. And then I was a budgetary cut at LIU economics. The recession started in, in New York and they had to be let go all their untenured faculty. And that was the end. I had been promised basically tenure if I finished my PhD and I did. And the next year I got a terminal letter. And I was very, you know, not only did I dislike graduate school, but I did it for the sake of security. <laughs> I was kind of pissed off <laughs> that I had to do, I had to go back to a lot of office work. And in this particular thing where I was proofreading, you know, this was actually a Yiddish text with someone. It was still a mechanical job. It wasn't what I was, you know, what I had trained for. So I was thinking back about my whole history about money and economics and how it influences. And I think that whole poem is about that, you know, and what you say about that split. And I think it was a very, Judy was very important in my life because she was like the first person I met who was the opposite of what my mother was doing. She, Judy was like, Judy didn't worry about what would happen 10 years from then, you know, from now. She said, I have to paint. I'm going to paint now. If I'll be poor, I'll be poor. I mean, she didn't She didn't have this thing about, I don't know, the, I'm sure it's not only Jewish, where you want to have something to fall back on. I mean, artists always hear that from parents and friends. You need something to fall back on because you'll never make money on your art, right? And Judy didn't think that way. I just never met anybody who was so indifferent. <laughs> and of course, I mean, she suffered with it. I mean, we were, we, the two of us, we didn't, we weren't very economically great together. And um, she had to sometimes sacrifice and work during the day, which she hated. I mean, she really, she, the last, I mean, decade of her life, she did do evening work, which was what her ideal. I mean, she taught evening classes and that kind of thing. So she had the day for painting. But when that context is about that when you don't have choices and you've got to do it. And I think that was what my mother wanted to sort of convey to me in a very kind of really, you know, frustrated. She was not a very articulate person in terms of self-knowledge or whatever. Um, you know, it's get up now. It doesn't matter. You don't want to go. You don't like it. It's The weather isn't good. You want to read too bad. Go and work. You have to look, know how to do that. And um, yeah, it's one of, I have to say, I don't have very many poems that I particularly look back on. That's one of the poems I do look back on context. I mean, I think it's a, I think I did a lot of things in there that I wanted to do and managed to do that I, in a way that I really liked, I, you know, and I think that whole thing about, I did my honors thesis on Melville, so I was very into Moby Dick and, and so, and Melville, so. I sort of, it got in there in that poem. Great. Well, we have the benefits of seeing Judy's beautiful work behind you, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. that gorgeous painting, and also having your, your poetry as well. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, both Naomi and Irina to, to do another reading. Um, and also, uh, I think, Naomi, you're reading the poetry about today. I feel hopeful and there's some wonderful things to say about the role of the poet and that poet. Today, I felt hopeful as I knelt close to the earth and turned it inch by inch, sifting the soil, clearing the way for roots of vegetables. I felt so hopeful that with repeated years and efforts, the monotony of daily motion of bending, and someday the earth would be uncluttered 
the debris clear. There is, I know, no reason for such hope, for nothing destroyed is ever made up or restored to us. In the earth are buried histories irretrievable. Yet what philosophy can justify any of our emotions? Like the watercolors from Buchenwald. Imagine the stench, the sound of the place, yet someone felt a need to paint and did. So do not ask me to explain why I draw meaning and strength from these common gestures. Why today? My hope is unwavering, solid, as if I'd never lost it and never would again, as if those dying angry or stunned at the stupidity of it could, uh, could be revived as if their mortal wounds could heal, as if their hunger could be outlived, as if they were not dying, strangers to others, strangers to themselves. Isn't there a few more lines on that one? No, the other oh. lines I added. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Okay, gorgeous. Well, unwavering, unwavering hope. Incredible. Arena, do you want to yeah, close gonna, this out with another one? Yeah, I'm going to read one of my flower poems. It's called A Butylon in Bloom. And it's dedicated to a wonderful, wonderful poet, Diana Balesi, an Argentinian poet that I met many years ago. And um, things were not so great in Argentina at the time <laughs> as they usually aren't in Argentina. Anyway, um, this is called a butylon in bloom. A butylon is a flowering indoor maple, a house plant. Cultivated inside, out of the bounds of nature, it's stubborn on the windowsill, six winters and springs, resisting water, sun, all research care. It would not give beyond its leaves. Yet today, in the morning light, the sudden color asserts itself among the spotted green, and I pause before another empty day and wonder at its wild blooming. It leans against the sun-warm glass, its blossoms firm on the thick stems, as if its roots absorb the knowledge that there is no other place, that memory is only pain, that even here, now, we must burst forth with orange flowers, with savage hues of our captivity. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Naomi, for these very beautiful, uplifting poems of hope and rejuvenation. I'd like to also bring in a few of the questions we have from the Q&A. Um, question from Jesse, is there a translation of Moby Dick into Yiddish? I have no idea, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was. <laughs> <laughs> go, to, go to Evo and, and put that question in the search. Yeah. Um, also from Marsha, um, Arena, how did you feel when you found out that a play was being written about you? 
Well, I have to admit that at the beginning, I kind of couldn't take it that seriously. I mean, it's like, it's very surreal. I have to say it's very surreal. I mean, in a way, I feel the same about the book. I mean, it's very difficult to look at when I was had to proofread the galleys for the book to go back 50 years. I mean, it's just, I was like another, I was like another person when I started this. So it's, it's very much to a certain extent, there's a kind of distance that I, you know, um, that I feel about it. It is my life, but I don't know. I mean, I can't quite, I can't quite grasp it. I have to say, um, it's a bit surreal. I mean, I'm, of course, I'm very honored and I'm, I'm very, very flattered. I mean, I just find it amazing. I mean, one thing that I'm really happy about is that I believe that the, you know, those of you like Naomi and Bruce have, have recognized sort of the some of the oral quality of my writing, which I'm very attached to. I'm really interested in voice. I'm interested in exploring different voices, whether it's monkeys or whether it's Palestinians or just, or Yiddishists. I mean, I just, I've always been interested in that oral quality. Not all of my poems are that way, but a lot are. And, um, and so I can see that there's an, there's a, a push kind of, because, I mean, it was interesting when I first saw Naomi, the first time I went to the West Coast and I saw her do Et La Havata, I was just stunned. I mean, because, I mean, I, I don't act. <laughs> and she like just embodied this poem in this incredible way that was like beyond the words. And that's always, I think, what we do, even when we don't perform poetry, but when we just read it, we kind of dig into underneath, you know, there's a subtext and there's a super text and all of these kinds of things that I think um, I'm very conscious of. And I said this once a couple of times. I mean, I was influenced by two oral traditions. One was in my shula. My Yiddish shula encouraged us memorizing poetry. Now it was all rhymed and it was sort of, it was the sweatshop poets and it was very simple, but we had to memorize it. English poetry in public school just didn't mean anything to me. I mean, we had to read the ancient Mariner. I didn't know what the hell it was about word anything but when i went to high school when i got to high school i read robert browning's for the first time my last duchess and that's a dramatic monologue in which there's this mysterious story behind the poem is it his last duchess meaning what happened to the other duchesses how many were there i mean it was very intriguing to me and i think i between both those traditions are oral traditions i mean you sort of envision a dramatic moment in someone speaking you sort of plunge into it. And I always liked that. And I tried to do that in some of my work, um, sort of duplicate that in a way. So it doesn't seem, I don't think, let's say, I don't think it's odd to me that some of the poetry is adaptable to the stage, but thinking of it as a life story is kind of surreal. <laughs> Right. It's sort of different. I could see the different pieces, you know, being on stage and being recited, but it's hard for me to see it as a kind of arc. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to also jump off from that. And Bruce, could you just talk about how you're animating the poetry? Because we've got an original score, we've got an ensemble, the characters. Can you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, it's so enjoyable. Uh, mm -hmm to create to stage this story and and the poetry and the the economy of words helps me to stage things in an eco economical way and to hit uh the important images and relationships so i'm really trying to tell the story through relationships and distances and where the father is in the scene where michal is and um, one one of the things that I, I keep wondering again is, uh, Irena, you describe um, the embrace of you and your mother as a fatal embrace in one of your poems, and I I put that out to the actors and to Naomi. What it, what is that exactly? That fatal embrace. So we've been trying to create that. Um, 
what that meant that um anyway things like those and memory monuments those those are things that just stick in my mind that i love to create and find a way of creating on stage those mem memory monuments that uh, Irena describes some of her work as. Um, and I love the flower poems. We call them the flower poems. They're so <laughs> full of hope and 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 hope. And I love staging those. And 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 with with Naomi, I almost just leave her alone. She's she's an archive <laughs> of of these poems in the world, it, just in her body. Um, and I love to see just what she does. You know, as a director, I want to do complicated, sophisticated. She takes two chairs and it's a whole aria. It's a whole piece. Uh, so a lot of it is just following the instincts of Naomi and um, staging story, how to stage story. Well, with that, I'd like to also just give acknowledgement to our whole cast some of which some of them are online, although we're in a webinar. So Naomi Newman is playing Irina as the poet today writing. Um, uh, Via Hernstead is the young Irina in different ages of stages and ages of her life. Uh, Ariel Lucky is playing Michal, the father, and Diana Bukowska is playing Rose, her mother. And our musicians are Barbara Borden, percussionist, and Suzanne DiVincenzo, who's, who's on cello and bass, uh, who have created this original scoring for the show. And we are just thrilled to work with this incredible team of artists uh, to bring uh, Arena's poetry to life on the stage. Um, as some of you may know, we're already sold out for this run. But the good news is we're going to be filming and making a film of the production, and that will be available on the Yiddish Theater Ensemble website. So my advice is to go on and also join the YTE mailing list, the email list, so that you can receive information um, about the next stages of the stage production, and we'll be in touch with you. And also, once again, if you'd like to purchase um, Arena's books, please go to Afi Komen bookstore online or in person, and um, they will be available for you. So I'd like to thank our guests for this very inspiring conversation, Naomi Newman, Irina Kleffish, and Bruce Bierman for a really inspiring hour. And uh, please join us again at Mechanics Institute for our programs online and in person. I just want to say just a thank you to everybody because I know this is a group effort and I know I know I can imagine the process and the problems and the pain and the joy. <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone for this. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I wish everybody the best break both legs or whatever it is that you feel <laughs> to make it a success. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. And thank you so, so much. It's really an honor. It's been our pleasure. And thank you, audience, for joining us once again.